Uh, thank you, Angeliki. I hope I don't have an echo in what you hear, as we did with your um, speaking earlier. Uh, uh, please try to correct this echo because you are the next speaker. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for attending this um, um, informative webinar about the potentially explosive atmospheres, ATEX, the directives and standards. Um, I would like to thank um, our um, guest uh, speaker today, Dr. Martin Tiddens. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tiddens, for uh, being with us, for uh, um, spending time um, to provide us with your precious and uh, valuable experience on the issue uh, so that um, our um, stakeholders and collaborators in Cyprus and at CYS uh, will uh, get uh, this um, experience and knowledge um, hopefully to assist them in uh, their um, uh, job and also uh, with uh, our collaboration because um, we are seeking their um, uh, help and assistance uh, in participating in uh, international and uh, regional standardization technical committees as an expert on behalf of CYS. Uh, so we are looking forward to get the maximum out of uh, your presentation. Uh, we're looking uh, to an interactive uh, webinar uh, with um, lots of questions uh, to be answered. Um, thank you also Angeli Gi for um, she's uh, first presentation about uh, CYS and our role in standardization as well as my colleagues in CYS that uh, have uh, uh, worked hard for um, having today this seminar. Um, let's then continue with Angeliki and uh, Dr. Tiddens. Thank you. I'm just, just uh, asking, do you, do you, uh, do you hear, hear twice? twice? <laughs> Is, is there, there an echo, echo now? Yes, there is. Let, let me try, try to fix the problem. problem. Because, because it's, I think it's very specific for, for you. you. Our, Our technician, technician is here, so we can fix the problem. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry for the delay. delay. Do you, Uh, we can now proceed uh, with my presentation uh, about CYN and these activities. For those who are not familiar uh, with the role and uh, mission of the organization, uh, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Angeliki Loizu. I'm a standardization uh, officer in CYS in the field of electrotechnical uh, sector, focusing mainly in the activities of uh, undertaken by CNELEC, the European Electrotechnical Organization. Uh, I myself 
I'm an electrical and computer engineer. And through my presentation, I would like to give you an overview of the role of CYS, the Cyprus Organization for Standardization. In the first section of uh, my presentation, I will pre uh, pre uh, briefly present CYS. In the second one, I will let you know how each interested party and each uh, uh, an expert can participate in standardization activities. And I will give you a, an overview of the new mirror committee 1110 uh, uh, about explosive atmospheres. Uh, this is a new, a new, a new developed uh, committee that was created after the transformation we made internally to uh, to allow the the mirror committees to better operate and to have uh, and to have better response from the stakeholders, and that's why we created specific uh, mirror committees of specific matters. C CYS is active in many fields and business sectors, including the construction sector, the electrotechnical sector, the chemical sector, uh, as well as sectors focusing on new uh, areas like sustainability and circular economy, when there is, uh, there is a strong uh, desire from the European Commission to develop standards towards a new to, uh, to these new sectors. Services is also a field that nowadays became more active uh, regarding standardization activities. CYS is an independent autonomous organization from the 1st of January 2005. Um, before that, it belonged to the Ministry of uh, Energy, Industry and Commerce. It operates under private law and is recognized by law as the national standards body of Cyprus. There is only one uh, organization uh, for each member state of the European uh, Union uh, that uh, uh, is dealing with standardization activities. In some countries, uh, there are two organizations, one dealing with the uh, electrotechnical sector only, and one dealing with all of the other sectors. Its only shareholder is uh, the Ministry of Finance. So CYS budget is derived from, from the uh, governmental budget and is approved each year by the Ministry of uh, Finance. CYS is a state-owned organization with all its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, as I said before, there was a change of status and metamorphosis in 2005. Um, before that, uh, the, um, the organization belonged to the, uh, it was a public body under full governmental uh, control. And then it was decided in 2005 that uh, we need uh, to be more independent uh, and more autonomous in order to bend the response to the market needs to be more flexible and to be less expensive to operate. So it was decided that the organization will be uh, out of the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Commerce, Industry and, and, and Energy and to become uh, in, in order to better respond to the needs of the market. This is our organizational chart of CYS. You can see that the main department is the standardization unit when uh, we have, uh, we are monitoring and following the work in the different sectors, the electrotechnical sector, the mechanical sector, the chemical sector, the civil engineering sector, the information technology sector. We have also supporting activities that are dealing with the organization of the tra training and informal disseminating of the lectures, and, and we have also our center of information and sets where uh, everybody can uh, buy standards or they can come to our library and uh, read the standards. Uh, CYS uh, has also a subsidiary company, which is, which is the Cyprus Certification Company, which is offering certification in management systems uh, mainly, but also to specific products. Uh, we are governed by a seven-member board of directors. Uh, the chairman of our directors is uh, uh, from the Cyprus Chamber of Commerce of Industry. 
We have uh, one representative from the Cyprus Consumer Association, one from the Cyprus Technical and Scientific Chamber, one from the Cyprus Employees and Industries Federation, one from the academia and more specifically from the uh, Cyprus University of Technology, one from the Ministry of Finance and one for the Ministry of Energy, Industry and Commerce. Uh, the board of directors is, um, is uh, appointed so that all the stakeholders as identified in the European regulation are represented. CYS at European level, he became a full member of CEN, which is the European Organization for Standardization that deals with all sectors except CENELEC, except the electrotechnical sector, which uh, the work is done by CENELEC. We are also a full member of ETSI, the um, uh, European Telecommunication Standard Institute. And at the international level, we are full member of ISO, the international organization for the standardization that uh, does this uh, work for all uh, sectors except uh, the electrotechnical sector, where the, done at the, uh, where the work done at the international level is done by IEC, the International Electrotechnical Organization. We are also became uh, recently a member or a full member of ITU, which is uh, the similar organization to ETSI at international level. The main activities of CYS, uh, the main activity of CYS is the promotion of the other European and international standards within the industry and organization in Cyprus. Uh, this is done through training and informative seminars like this one, lectures when there is specific need from an organization or an association regarding uh, a specific standard or a bundle of standards that they need to be informed. We also have uh, uh, the obligation to publish articles regarding new standardization work or new activities. We also uh, uh, do visits to companies and associations and uh, industries when uh, we are called to do so, be because we are, um, we are a non-profit organization and our, our main uh, task is to promote the implementation of standards in, uh, in Cyprus, European and international ones. Also, uh, experts are nominated by CYS can, uh, can participate in the European and International Technical Committees, uh, where they contribute to the actual content of the standard, share their knowledge with other expert experts active in the field, attend the meetings and be able to promote the national standards of Cyprus. Through the networking provided with the participation, CYS experts are able to exchange practices and good, um, good uh, experiences with other companies that are pioneers in the field and have cooperation, participate in joint projects or European funding activities. Also, CYS is represented at European and International Standardization Organizations at technical level and an administra an administrative level. One of the main tasks of CYS is also to develop uh, national standard specifications and schemes when there is a need from the market to do so. Our more recent work is the a new, newly developed uh, and the newly founded TC28 uh, about the natural trace, where a national uh, specification will be developed uh, that will set out the requirements for the natural trace. We also have uh, our customer service and information center where you can be informed about the European standards developed by Sense and ELEC and ETSI, the European standards organizations, the international ones. And also we have the ability to, to sell uh, standards from other countries, from other European countries, since we have specific agreements with them. Either the Greek uh, national uh, standards organization or the German one or the British uh, one. Uh, we also operate subscrip subscription schemes for public authorities and private organizations. We also have a subscription scheme with uh, universities, uh, the two state owned and the five private ones, where the students have access to the actual content of the standard. 
This was done in order to make students more familiar with standards and to make future professionals aware of the, uh, of the advantages of implementing standards. The goal is when the, uh, the students actually enter the market, they know the use of the standard and they know how they can improve the quality of their products and services in the company or organization they are, they, they are working. We also have an access through our uh, customer service uh, department to the bibliographic base of Perinor that contains one, uh, over 1 million standards of 200 organizations publishing and developing standards. So anybody that needs to know what, uh, what standards exist in a specific sector uh, can come to the center and uh, we can give you the information uh, about the standards that exist in, the, in a specific matter. Uh, the way you can participate in standardization activity uh, uh, is um, by being a member of uh, different types of, uh, of, um, of uh, standardization bodies. But first of all, uh, because I don't know if uh, anybody is familiar with what a standard is, I would like to say that um, the implementation of standards is everywhere although it is not always visible. I mean, you can see a standard being implemented in the size of a credit card or the paper of uh, the size of A4 paper or the plug use or in many other products. But um, uh, we are, you are not aware that the, the implementation of standard is, uh, is, a, is implemented in this way. A standard, as it's stated in the European regulation, is a, spe a technical specification adopted by a recognized standardization body like CYS, like CEN, CENELEC, Etsy, for repeated and continuous application, where compliance is not compulsory unless it is stated in the law of the country. And it can be an international standard, a European standard, a, a harmonized standard, uh, that means that uh, it's a European standard uh, that is adopted on the basis of a request by the European Commission for the application of the Union Harmonization legislation. Each e European Commission issues a standardization request where they ask the European organizations uh, bodies to develop and deliver standards to satisfy the needs and requirements of the European market and the goals of, and the ambitions of the European uh, Union. And we have also national standards. Uh, that means that the standard is developed and adopted by the national standardization body, like the standard we have, uh, the like the standard that will uh, be developed by the Natural Trace Technical Committee will be uh, adopted by CYS. So he have uh, in front of it the prefix uh, CYS. That means it is adopted by CYS. Now the, uh, the way a standard is developed is that uh, a new your card time can be proposed by any member of Senate Senelec at the European level, and it can be supported by any other member. The respected TV, which is responsible for the standardization work uh, under the specific item will evaluate the proposal and identify the experts uh, available and willing to work on the standard. After the national standards bodies are invited to nominate their experts to draft the new standard. Uh, after the new standard is, is draft, uh, then uh, the standards enter the public inquiry stage where all members are requested to vote and comment. The, comment, the comments are gathered by the technical committee and they are evaluated by the experts participating in the technical committee. And then they propose changes and the, the text is uh, formulated. The draft standard then enters the formal vote stage where all the members need to approve or reject the standard. At this stage, the national standard bodies can only suggest uh, editorial or general changes and not technical ones. And after the, uh, uh, the standard is approved, it is published and CYS has the obligations to adopt the specific standard and withdraw all the conflicting ones, either they are national or not. As I, as I said before, there are different ways and different types to participate in uh, standardization work. You can be a, me a member of a mirror committee. That means that 
through this, uh, through this role, you can monitor the work of European International Technical Committee in the field that you are interested. Uh, you have the chance to represent and develop the national position on European international draft standards, as I said before, in the stages that I mentioned. You can also be a part of the National Technical Committee where uh, national standards and national specifications are developed. And you can be an expert in the uh, European and technical and international technical committees where you have to participate actively in the TC. You have to vote the vote, all the documents of the committee, uh, either expressing uh, the, the opinion of the country regarding a, 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 an issue or a technical issue or a general issue. And you also have the obligation to attend the meetings uh, of the TC. Now there are a lot of meetings of the TC that are done uh, uh, virtually. Uh, and uh, that uh, before COVID, they were only done physically. So the, the way, uh, we, there is a, a lot of uh, ways to participate in standardization activities. If you are willing to share your knowledge and exchange experiences with other experts in the field at the European level. The basic principles when participating in standardization uh, in standardization is uh, in standardization works is that the activity is voluntary and not mandatory. So uh, uh, nobody is obliged to uh, to participate in standardization activities unless they want to. In order to to project to to proceed and the, the, the standards to be approved, the, there needs to be a consensus within the members of the technical committee. All the members participating in the technical committees have to approve in, in certain things in order for the draft standard or the specifications to go through the, uh, the public inquiry stage and the formal vote. All the work that has been done is uh, transparent and accessible. There is also integrity and efficiency within the technical committees, and there, uh, there is coherence at European and international levels since uh, the international organizations and the European ones have agreements between them in order to align their activities and, and, and to avoid double work. In the, in, uh, in the electrotechnical uh, electro sector, uh, we have several mirror committees that uh, are uh, developed and uh, we are uh, started the procedure of uh, collecting and uh, informing uh, the public about the existence of these mirror committees. We have committees on batteries, on general electro electrical technology, in electrical components, in electrical installations, in electric machines, devices, equipment, instruments, and apparatus, in power systems, in light and lamps. Because the electrotechnical sector is a very uh, broad uh, sector, I mean, it's from plugs to railway stations. It is. Uh, we made an effort to gather technical committees uh, under specific uh, fields in order to be able to attract as experts more easily to the work being done for, uh, under the European International Technical Committees. We also have uh, mirror committees in other sectors, in uh, the environmental sector, in the energy sector, in the smart sector, in the safety sector where the explosive atmospheres um, mirror committee is lying. We have uh, also uh, committees in security and, uh, and the safety in the electrotechnical uh, sector. Specifically for the mirror committee in uh, the explosive atmospheres, we, we have uh, uh, constructed uh, the mirror committee 1110, which is uh, for the explosive atmospheres, where uh, the mirror committee is responsible for uh, monitoring the work of several technical committees as they are set here. Uh, the main committee is the Senelec TC31, electrical apparatus for potent potentially explosive atmospheres where our, our expert, Dr. Tiddens, uh, comes from. He's uh, the chairman of the ICTC31, which uh, is uh, developing standards at international level. Senelec TC31 is um, mirroring the work done at ICTC31 and also develops other projects if there is a, a specific European uh, need to do so. 
more specifically, this committee uh, is uh, its scope is to prepare and maintain European standards relating to equipment for use when there is a hazard due to the possible presence of explosive atmospheres of gases, vapors, mist, or combustible dust. In, just to give you a, a brief overview of what standards are available uh, in this committee, you can see that these uh, standards related to equipment and the production equipment uh, to, to relevant uh, sources. These are the, uh, some of the standards that the committee uh, develops. There are ov over 100 standards in this field uh, of explosive industries at the uh, European level. There is also a CENTC uh, in uh, 305, uh, potentially explosive atmospheres, explosion prevention and prote uh, protection that uh, deals with the developing of standards in the fields of test methods uh, for determining the flammability characteristics of substances and also the equipment and pro uh, protective systems for use in po potential explosive atmospheres and equipment and systems for explosion prevention and protection. Some of the standards that this committee is dealing with is, is, uh, is there is a standard for the basic concept methodology uh, to address uh, what is explosion pre prevention and protection. There are also standards for the systems, the explosion suppression systems for the explosion resistance equipment, and also for the dust explosion venting protective system. There are a lot of standards in this committee uh, regarding different types of systems. Now, in uh, the IC level, in the international uh, uh, level, there is um, a system, the IC system for certification to standards relating to equipment for use in explosive atmospheres. It uses quality assessment uh, specifications that are uh, based on the international uh, standards prepared by ICTC 31. The objective of the system is to facilitate international trading equipment and services for use in explosive atmospheres while maintaining the uh, required level of safety. This was done in order to reduce the cost, which is quite high for the manufacturers, to reduce the time that needs uh, uh, the, uh, the, product, uh, the equipment to enter the market to um, enhance the international confidence assessment process for products, equipment, personnel, and facilities. Also to have one database where all the certified equipment, components, personnel, are fa and facilities are stated. And uh, to, min to maintain international confidence in equipment, uh, personnel and services covered by IECEX uh, certification scheme. In this field, there are different schemes. Uh, there is a scheme uh, referring to the, uh, to the equipment that provides the means for manufacturers, regulators, and users of equipment using hazardous areas to address the risk of fires or explosions from flammable gases or dust. Testing and certification facilitates the sale of safer products internationally at a lower cost. There is also a scheme that covers the service facility scheme and uh, through this scheme, uh, all the technical equipment, the competence of the staff and the quality management system of the separate provider is uh, inspected and covered. The scheme is uh, developed in such a way in order to help the industry to select the right type uh, partners. And it's an excellent tool for service providers to present their competency. There is also a scheme uh, referring to the um, personnel competencies uh, of uh, people uh, working in the explosive atmospheres environment. Since uh, the safety of commercial facilities with hazardous locations depends strongly on the competence of all people dealing with the safety management, the planning, the installation, the operation, the inspection, the maintenance, the repair, and many other activities. Uh, so these schemes uh, is offered in order to uh, to provide confidence for the um, for the technical knowledge of the personnel working in these environments. There are, are other two schemes operating in uh, within IEC. One about the conformity, uh, conformity mask uh, marker licensing, and one about the uh, training providers that provide training regarding explosive atmospheres. 
but more about the subject will be covered by Dr. Thedens, which is uh, which knows the uh, the, uh, the matter uh, very good, and he's an expert in the field. Uh, thank you for your time for my presentation. And now that we can proceed with the pre presentation of our uh, expert, uh, Dr. Thedens, which is uh, our main expert of the event. He is the chair of ICTC 31, Equipment for Explosive Atmospheres. He's an electrical engineer with expertise on explosive atmospheres, the new harmonization procedures, and with 25 years of experience in the topic of explosion protection. He's also an experienced vocational trainer, a member of ATEX, IEC, and ICX committees. Dr. Thedens was from uh, 2008 to 2020 the chair of the group of all European notified bodies according to the ATEX directive. Dr. Thiden, it's our pleasure that you have accepted the invitation and uh, you are willing to share your knowledge and expertise with the Cypriot stakeholders. It is our honor and uh, it is an honor and privilege for us for sharing that knowledge, the 25 years knowledge. Uh, so the floor is yours. You can, you are co -host. Okay, yeah, just... Welcome also from my side. A pleasure to, to be with you here. Uh, thanks, Mr. Kamas and uh, Mrs. Luizu for the introduction. I'm trying to share my screen now. Oh, you have to release me now. Now it's possible. Oh, which one? Maybe this one. And... Okay, hope you can see my screen now. Um, oh, where's my, okay, I will stop my video because to save bandwidth. Okay, so uh, once again, thanks uh, for, for the invitation. Pleasure uh, to be with you here for today. Um, yeah. Uh, the content, as uh, uh, explained, is, well, a little bit of everything. Um, for, for sure, the, this short webinar can give only an overview of the different topics. We will highlight a little bit the basic of explosion protections. Uh, I will go a little bit to the legal point of view, to the directives, and for sure, uh, some words about standards and standardization. Uh, I've you seen, I've used a little bit the color code in here. You don't need to recognize which color belongs to what uh, because you see it on the slides later on. Uh, uh, what I want to show is that everything is in, 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 in combination with uh, each other. So every topic is not a standalone topic. You, you can see it also uh, looking to that uh, in, in the center, I say we've placed the product, but of course we need to have the technical background, what we are doing, where we are doing uh, and the explosion area. We do have constructional requirements. We do need to talk about certification, which is needed for the market access. Uh, we've got user requirements. So we've got the users, we've got the manufacturers, we've got test houses, we've got different stakeholders involved in our product. Uh, and uh, you see it with the color code there. So the, the, the basic principles are involved nearly everywhere, standards are involved and for sure the legal aspects. So uh, let, let me ask the, uh, for the first question, why, why, why do we need to have explosion protection? Um, for sure, this is a picture of Hollywood, um, but it symbolized that we always need an, an, a fuel. Uh, we need oxygen and we need an ignition source. And all, if all three come together, we've got a perfect uh, explosion. Well, as I mentioned, uh, uh, this is Hollywood. Um, this is the reality. This is uh, 1921, the, the, the big hole in Ludwigshafen Oppau in Germany, uh, where 4,000 tons of ammonia sulfate nitrous uh, were exploded with 
560 dead persons. So explosion protection is not only a matter of question of the history. Well, this is the same substance. In 2020, you all know that big explosion in uh, Beirut, also a big hole uh, with a lot of uh, thousands of um, dis destroyed areas um, in Beirut. So we do need to work on the field of explosion protection. We do need to define what we are talking about. We are talking about an explosive atmosphere, potentially explosive atmosphere. And now you see the color code, of, for example, over there. For sure, that's basic principle knowledge. It's part of the legal requirements and it's described also on standards. So when we are talking of an explosive atmosphere, we are thinking of a flammable substance, could be a gas, vapor, mist or dust, in a mixture with air under so-called atmospheric conditions. And after an ignition, the combustion spreads to the entire mixture. And you see atmospheric conditions is also a defined term defined by standards. Normally it said, well, it's a temperature range from minus 20 to plus 40 and the pressure range of uh, 0.8 bar to 1.1 bar. Uh, the wide range of humidity and the normal uh, oxygen content, what we have in air. Um, this is just the definition of atmospheric conditions. Now we have to consider the for sure different hazardous areas where such an explosive atmosphere could occur. Uh, you, you, I think you are coming also from the industry part. Uh, we have uh, the mining, we have uh, the, the, the non-mining, the chemicals industry, um, we've got um, offshore, onshore, we've got silos, we've got the industry in painting and whatever. So different hazardous areas requiring um, specific explosion protected areas. And what we do is with the area classification, for example. Uh, considering the fundamental elements of EX, so which type of gas you have, which type of substance, you need to know the, the characteristics. Um, it's a combination also that you uh, determine the uh, likelihood of the occurrence and the extent of the areas which are affected. Um, for example, for this, we have standards, uh, which our 10-1 uh, and 10-2, uh, it's one is for gases, two is for dust. We are explaining how an area classification could be done. What we have with this area classification, we define our so-called zones. We've got for the gas in zone zero, zone one and zone two, and the similar uh, definitions for the zones for dust, which is 20, 21 and 22. Uh, and the most uh, important point is that for zone zero, we think we have all the time uh, an explosive atmosphere present. In zone one, it's uh, occasionally. Uh, and for zone two, not likely to have an uh, explosive atmosphere. And if it's still there, it's just a short period. What you will find in the standards is a description for sure of that area classification, but no numbers are given. You cannot say, well, for five minutes in one year, this is for sure a short period, this is zone two. Normally I would say, yes, it is. But if you have during this five minutes, definitely ignition sources present, you cannot declare that to zone two, for example. So it's dangerous to give numbers in there, you have to have an individual um, assessment of, of your site, for example. So you need the full knowledge of the explosion characteristics, uh, knowledge of how the mixture is, is spread through the entire um, plant to make your uh, area classification, just as an example. Um, you have to have knowledge on the basic principles of explosion protection. Um, normally it's given in this three level system at the first to avoid the formation of an explosive atmosphere, maybe by using an inert gas. 
The second level would be to avoid the ignition of an explosive atmosphere. This is where our products are linked with. And the third level, of course, is, well, if the explosive atmosphere is still there, I cannot avoid fully the ignition of that atmosphere. Well, I need to reduce the impact of that explosion to an acceptable level. For example, with flame arresters or venting devices. Right now, I want to come to the point I want to focus on the products and the different type of um, uh, protections later on. So thinking of the term of product, for example, this is now a term which isn't used in standards. The term product is a legal term which is used by the directive. Um, now I focus a little bit to the ATEX directive, which divides our products as a general wording into equipment, protective systems and components. And equipment could be everything, a machine, apparatus, fixed or mobile devices and so on. It must have an own potential source of ignition. This is related to equipment. If you haven't got your own potential source of ignition, then it's not an equipment according to the ATEX directive. The, another term is this protective systems you see like flame arresters or burst disks. And we do have components, which is uh, an item which is essential to the safe function of the equipment or pot and protective system, but does not have an autonomous function. Well, for sure, you know all the electrical equipments which could be part in the hazardous area, uh, all what you know. We've got the mechanical, so the non-electrical equipment, which is so-called an equipment based on physical and mechanical effects. For, for example, a, a pump itself is a purely mechanical equipment. For sure, a pump normally is in, has a combination with a motor, but then it's an assembly, a combined equipment. The pump itself, for example, is purely mechanical. And we do have, for example, components, like uh, here are some examples, the ballast, the, the, uh, the, the cable entry, uh, the plastic tubes, uh, the connection devices, or such an empty enclosure or the conveyor belt, or the fork itself from a forklift truck. These are just components. And remember, I was talking on combined equipment, uh, which could be called uh, assemblies, equipment assemblies, uh, which is more or less, you see, just like a fuel gas heating skit or this chemical injection skit. It's a combination of products, forming a new product. But on the other hand, we say on the uh, top right position, the switch gear, well, this is an EX equipment. This is not normally not adapted as an assembly because it's, we have requirements for such switch gears. But on the, uh, uh, down on the right, you see this uh, installation of this, um, um, oh, now the word is missing. Uh, with the tubes, with the tubes, uh, the conduit, uh, the conduit system. We, this is not equipment. This is part of an installation, for example. So the difference are not always very easy, and we have to consider uh, the difference of the area, um, the different requirements. And looking to the ATEX directive, we are saying, well, we are not off usable for offshore. The requirements are completely different. And when you are using on the offshore, onshore equipment, well, it looks like that. So always you have to consider in which area you are. What the directive also is saying is the intended use of products. The manufacturer says, my product should be used for that purpose, full stop. It's the intention of the manufacturer to say what the intended use is. 
he will inform the user of all needed informations for the safe use of the equipment. And for sure, this is done by the manual. And now it's a legal aspect. If a, manu if a user is using a product in a different way, which is not according the manual, well, and something happens, the manufacturer is safe because the user does not use the product in a way which was described. So we've got this, again, this equipment to the user part, we've got the manufacturer and we've got the user just to highlight once again, the different wordings. We've got components, which is fully only with the manufacturer, not a final product to be used by the end user. It's only with the manufacturer. It could be used within an equipment or protective system. This belongs to the manufacturer, but also as part of the user. We've got an assembly, which could be more or less also an installation, but you can have it also as a product, for example. And the installation part is definitely for the user. Huh? You see some switch gears are more or less a product. The skid could be an assembly, but it's more or less an installation. And the tricky point is for the users, the requirement and the directive, when you're manufacturing a product for your own use, it's not installation. You have to fulfill the ATEX directive, you're a manufacturer. Looking a little bit more into the second explosion protection principle, which was the avoidance of the ignition source or the ignition itself. Normally it could be done by uh, the application of the type of protection for mechanical and electrical equipment. And the basic principles is the separation of the atmosphere and the ignition source, or the limitation of the energy, use of creepage and clearance distance, and choose of suitable materials. So we have constructural solutions for the design of the equipment, which could be used then in the hazardous, hazardous areas. And this is what we call with our type of protections. We've got several type of protections for electrical and non-electrical equipment and separation of gas and dust. Just an overview in here for the different types of protections. More or less, I think you all know most of these type of protections. Some of these type of protections are for electrical equipment only. Some are, could be used for non-electrical equipment only, and some are for electrical equipment and dust only. For example, flameproof enclosure, even if the standard is purely written for the electrical equipment, it could be used for non-electrical equipment as well. Uh, it's here a mixture, a little bit of the old European marking or type of protections we still had in the past for mechanical equipment, for example, we've got the constructional safety or the protection by control of ignition sources, this old C, B marking, the, the liquid immersion with K marking, which were original European standards. We convert that all now to an international standard and the symbol is just H, but I will come to that later on a little bit as well. So we've got technical requirements, which are given in our standards. We've got the general requirement standard part zero, which isn't a standalone standard. You have to use always a type of protection standard or a specific standard for a specific product in conjunction with part zero for electrical equipment. So for an intrinsic safety equipment, you always have to have part zero and part 11, for example. This is the difference to mechanical equipment. The basic standard for mechanical equipment is the part 36. This is a standalone uh, stand, uh, uh, document. The um, ignition hazard assessment method is described in there and you can make a product only using part 36. Maybe it's necessary to use the old uh, type of protections 
uh, the constructor safety, the ignition control of ignition source and liquid immersion, which is now part uh, described in part 37. Or you can use, of course, additionally part one for flame proof or part two for uh, pr uh, pressurized systems. So that I will come later. So we've got now an equipment and for sure you want to come to the market. We have to have fulfilled conformity assessment parts. And always we have in mind there are market surveillance parts. But with different schemes, it's described in a different way. Um, the market is the whole world. And we have uh, in specific areas, uh, specific uh, acceptance schemes for the US, for example, UL is accepted or CSA in Canada, Brazil is in Metro. In, in Russia, it was GOST R, or in China, for example, XNEPSI, now it's replaced by CCC. And in Europe, it's uh, the ATEX directive. But all is based on our ISC TC31 standards. I will come to that later as well. And as uh, Angelica explains, we've got the ICX system for a worldwide certification scheme. Okay, our legal base in Europe, for sure, this is now a point of view of Germany. We've got for the safety of equipment, our ATEX directive 2014-34 EU, which needs to be transferred to national law. So also in Cyprus, we have transferred the directive into national law. Uh, we have done this in, in Germany with the product safety law. So the conformity assessment for the products is given in there. And for the safety of plants and workplace, we've got the other uh, directive in the ATEX field, which is the 1999-92 EC. And also this directive needs to be transferred to national law. For example, in Germany, it's done by the worker protection law. Just to show when we are talking on the ATEX system and the involvement, uh, 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 the implementation of the ATEX directives, all stakeholders are involved. For sure, the, the, uh, the directive itself, it's coming from the European Commission, but the standardization is involved with uh, San Sanelec and our uh, uh, HES consultants. Uh, the ATEX manufacturers uh, are involved. The users are involved. We've got the involvement of our um, notified body group. Uh, right now we've got in Europe uh, 79 notified bodies from, uh, different, from 25 different countries. You can have a look to the Nando database uh, to find, to search for the notified body related for the ethics directive. And by the way, uh, we've got also notified bodies from Canada uh, based on the CETAP uh, um, agreement with, between Europe and Canada. So the um, ATEX ATCA group, which is for the market, market surveillance is involved. And finally, of course, always the, the European Parliament. So all interest stakeholders are involved in the implementation of the ATEX directive. Um, the, 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 the directive itself, um, it's just a, a trade um, directive. Uh, the main issue of the ATEX directive is to remove of trade barriers uh, for, for uh, explosion protected equipment. So it's just a directive to come to the European market. Um, the directive itself, it's available in the official journal of the European Union in each uh, language of each member state. Uh, it's like the law, I will say. And uh, looking in Germany, um, lawyers are earning a lot of money of making an interpretation of laws. Uh, uh, the European Commission makes its own interpretation, which, which is also available on the European uh, a web page uh, for, for the ATEX. Uh, recently now and uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, uh, the first edition, uh, an updated edition of the ATEX guidelines 
uh, 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 were published. And with this, the, the directive text is given and an official interpretation of the ATEX uh, group within this, what I've shown in the chart uh, before. So as I mentioned, the, the aim of the ATEX directive is the free movement of products within the EU based on harmonized requirements and put, put, uh, procedures to establish compliance. We've got the CE conformity marking and of course the EU declaration of conformity. Um, the ATEX itself, the directive does not give pure technical requirements. Uh, we've got just a general statement which said, well, um, you have to fulfill the essential health and safety requirements. Um, and, and in general, I want to say this is very short. It's just said, well, your product must be safe for the area where you want to use it. And we have so-called harmonized standards. Uh, when we are using a so-called harmonized standard, well, we've got the presumption of conformity uh, of the essential heels and safety requirements. We don't need to use standards. We have to fulfill the ATEX directive. We can do it with another possibility, but mostly it's done by using one of the harmonized standards. And the harmonized standard must be uh, uh, listed in the official journal. And it's of course a EN standard. So when we want to come with your product to the European market, you have to fulfill one of the modules. Uh, and it depends a little bit of the type of equipment you want to use. Is it an electrical or non-electrical equipment or protective system? And for which category, so for which zone your product, you want to use it. The final issue is you want to sign as a manufacturer the EU declaration of conformity. You can do it by using uh, the module G, which is for the unit verification, which is for all categories. Uh, for category three equipment, electrical, which is for zone two or zone 20, or the non-electrical, which is also for the zone one equipment. You've got just the module A, the internal production control. For all the others, you need to have an uh, EU type examination certificate issued by a notified body together with one of the modules for the production verification. And then when you have both, you are able to make your own EU declaration of conformity, for example. You all know the CE conformity marking. It's just the label saying that all relevant directives are fulfilled. Looking to a product, maybe more than one directive needs to be fulfilled. Thinking of an electrical product, maybe it's not only the ethics directive, maybe the EMC directive, maybe others, um, maybe it's the machinery directive as well. Then of course you have to fulfill a statement related to all directives. And you can have on your product only one CE logo because you can have a statement only once, for sure for all involved directives, but only one CE logo on the product. The EU declaration of conformity, the content is given, uh, also stated in the directive itself with uh, all what needs to be in there. Uh, I don't want to go through the list. It's a, uh, it's the identification of the product. Uh, which directives you have to fulfill and so on. And for sure, it must be signed by a responsible person. Together with the EU Declaration of Conformity, the second most important uh, piece of paper which needs to be accompanied by the product is the manual. It's not the certificate. Normally the certificate, if there is any, is part of the manual. So there are some requirements for the manual. And it said that the most important point has to be available for each equipment or protective system in a language which could be understood by the end user, according to the requirements given by each member state. 
Um, lo lo looking to manufacturers, normally it said, well, our manual, oh, well, we have it in English and that's sufficient for all the European market. Well, yep, but I know some market surveillance authorities, which for example, in Poland require a, 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 a manual in the Polish language. For a manufacturer, it could be difficult because responsible for the content. Um, we as PTB is a German notified body. We issue our certificates in English, uh, in German, and we do have an English translation. For some certificates, we provide a French translation. Um, I have to sign that. And I wasn't very comfortable with that because I cannot understand French. But I, when I signed a French certificate, I'm responsible for that. So this is, of course, a little difficulty if you are not familiar with the foreign language, but we do have in our European Union, our 16 languages of different member states. And if a national body says, well, we require a standard in our member state um, um, language, well, okay. This is always a very critical point. But what is given in the manual or as a requirement in the uh, directive for the manual is you have to put all information which is needed for the safe use. You have to give instructions for putting into service, installation use, assembling, dismantling, maintenance, servicing, repair, adjustments. Everything must be in there. For example, this is the general requirement in the directive. In our standard part zero, we specify this a little bit more and give more details, for example. So this is the area where, where we are saying uh, the legal requirement on one hand and standardization requirements on the other hand. Well, and for the user, it said, well, it's helpful to make the use of the manual available also during normal operation to ensure that it will be possible to read the manual during a failure. Well. <clears throat> But placing the, the, the manual directly into the equipment is not always a very good idea. So um, we've got the EU type examination certificate, which is needed for the market access in Europe. We've got with this certificate a statement that all the X requirements are fulfilled. We've got an, additionally this QAN, this quality notification, and the manufacturer is responsible to issue the EU declaration of conformity to affix the CE logo by fulfilling, as I mentioned earlier, also other directives. Now looking to the ISC system. ISC normally is um, a standardization body may, may making standards. You see it in the middle for the standardization management board. But we do have also, as uh, explained earlier, uh, some uh, conformity assessment schemes. And one is this ICX scheme, which, well, uh, is producing or demonstrating uh, that um, equipment fulfills the IC TC31 standards. Uh, it's, in, it's an online system. You can have all information available on the online system for the different schemes and so on. All documents are given online. Well, with this ICX certificate also, um, it said that all the X requirements are fulfilled. The, the ICX COC is linked to an QAR. Uh, and this is, could be a basis for the market access. Uh, just to compare it with, with the ATEX directive, for the market access, for on the ICX side, it's only EX. With the EU declaration of conformity, for sure, it's more than, because as I mentioned, you have to fulfill also the other directives, EMC and whatever. Um, the basic difference between both systems, for sure, it's an ATEX is a mandatory system um, within for the European market. You have to fulfill the ATEX directive, otherwise you cannot enter the European market. 
ICX is not a regulation system. It could be accepted. For example, it's accepted as a market exists in Australia or New Zealand. But for example, in Australia, not for mining. ATEX, as I mentioned, uh, does not require conformity with standards. Although we have the harmonized standards, we can uh, show that the uh, 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 conformity of or the we have safe products could be done also by other techniques. ICX is a fully compliance of the uh, used standards. ATEX does not require the accreditation of an ATEX notified body. We are notified by individual uh, or we are notified by our ministry of work. Uh, and it's just a notification process. The minister is saying, well, PTB is good. I name PTB as an ATEX notified body. While ESCX, ICX is a peer assessment scheme applying for the ISO guide 65 and, and 7025 and 65 uh, um, uh, acceptance. For sure, we do have benefits in the ATEX directive. Um, we, 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 we can have a flexibility for the manufacturers, not mandatory using standards. We, uh, the manufacturers has to consider the change of the state of art and of new standard editions. So the ATEX products are always up to date. Uh, placing products to the European market is possible for mechanical equipment of category two and all equipment of category three without the involvement of a notified body. So, and the responsibility of a sold product for the intended use uh, as described in the manual has got the manufacturer for the lifetime of the product. We do have a strong market surveillance activities within Europe. Um, our EN standards are normally uh, always technical identical with the IEC and X, uh, with the IEC standards. So for a notified body, for example, when we've issued an ATEX certificate, it's very easy to issue also the IECX certificate or vice versa. Um, and as I mentioned, within the ATEX, the risk assessment is done by the manufacturer for all risks related with the product, not only the explosion hazards. For example, the low voltage directive must be fulfilled uh, as being part of the ATEX directive, but the low voltage directive is not listed in the EU declaration of conformity, but you have to say which standards you have used to fulfill the low voltage directive. This is a little bit tricky, but anyway, for sure we've got done key problems, um, mainly for companies coming from outside of Europe, this uh, difficulties with the self-responsibility of the manufacturers um, and this, some of the manufacturers are not confident enough for the self-certify equipment for category three and so on. And for sure, global harmonization requires uh, or is required by manufacturers and users to have, well, at least one standard, one product and one installation concept. We are doing this with our standards. And one of benefit of ICX for sure is we've got the proficiency testing scheme. Every two years, two programs are launched by the proficiency testing provider and all ICX test laboratories have to participate on that system. That's a good issue. Um, I want to jump to the marking, uh, which is all, always a good point for, for, for talking about markings. We do have different marking requirements. We've got the ICX mark, we've got old markings here with this EX, SCH and EX. We've got the, the, the EX for the user markings and so on. Uh, we have always to say, well, which part of the marking are we are looking for? And we have to divide our marking string on the X products into two parts. We have got the marking according to the ATX directive which is this epsilon kappa and the hexagon, 
plus an equipment group, which is group one for mining or group two, which is all which is not mining. And we've got specific equipment categories, M1 and M2 for mining. And this 1G, 1D or 2G, 2D or 3G, 3D, G for gas, D for dust. And this category, which is linked to the zone where an equipment could be used. When I look now to the marking, it just is a very simple marking. We've got the CE logo plus the number of the notified body, which is involved in the production control phase. And we've got this Epsilon Kappa, for example, this 2, 2G. This is the marking based on legal requirements. And we've got the marking of the type of protections, which is the marking coming from the standards. I will come to that a little bit later. So this is the marking of a product. Now looking to the marking of a component uh, from the certificate number point of view, we've got a U behind the certificate number to identify this is a component. It's not allowed to put the C logo on the component, but the number of the involved notified body must be placed there. And from the standard point of view, we cannot have a temperature class because it's not ready for use. It's not for the users, it's just to be used by other manufacturers. And the standard requires also, no, sorry, the ATEX directive requires the marking of equipment with the name and address of manufacture. The address is the highlight of the ATEX directive. It's not required by the standard. We've got for sure the CE conformity marking, the identification of the product, serial number, year of construction, and the marking according to the ATEX directive. And it said, furthermore, when necessary, the equipment must also be marked with all information essential to the safe use. And this is a link to the marking of the different type of protections. Just as a, you, you, you have said, well, we've got the IC standards, we've got European standards, and we've got national standards. You've got that system as well in, in, in Cyprus. We've had the system also in Germany, just as an old equipment here. You see the marking requirements in the uh, VDE standard from 1944, which looks a little bit what we have today. And it's linked to such old equipment with this very old markings. Now looking to the modern marking of equipment, which is, well, a little bit more confusing, uh, but it follows a, a structure. When I look now to the marking according the uh, part zero, which is the general requirement document, it said, well, the marking starts with the X symbol, just EX, with the type of protections used, so the DB and EB, with a group, in this case for 2C, the temperature class, T4, as I mentioned, not for components, and finally by the equipment protection level, EPL. So we've got the small ABCs behind the type of protection symbols, which is called level of protection. And we've got finally the equipment protection level, which characterize the whole equipment and is saying for which group, so gas or dust, and for which zone the whole equipment is good. The small symbol ABC for the level of protections are said, well, A fulfills requirements for zone zero or 20, B for one and 21, and C for two or 22. We've got the classification into the temperature classes. So we have the ignition temperature of the substance. So the substances are classified according to temperature class. For example, hydrogen has got a ignition temperature higher than 450 degrees C, so it's T1. And the equipment itself is classified according to the maximum surface temperature. And so this all matches together. We've got special markings. If you've got 
to C, or we can have, for example, which is given in the standard 2B plus H2. It means that the equipment is usable in a 2B atmosphere and also in an atmosphere with hydrogen. Or we have got also on certificates or on the product given multiple temperature classes. It said that, for example, the T4 is suitable for an ambient uh, temperature range from minus 20 to plus 55, which is an extended temperature range, or T6 for the normal atmospheric conditions. We've got markings for the dust. It's, you see, similar to what is for the gas. We've got the EX symbol, we've got the type of protection, we've got the group. For dust, we've got different uh, subgroups. We've got 3A, 3B, and 3C. And normally not the temperature class is given, it's directly the temperature. And finally, uh, uh, the EPL. In former times, there was also the IP code given as a part of the marking, which isn't part of the marking anymore. Uh, you can find an IP code marking on the equipment, but it's not related to the EX marking required by the standard, for example. Now, what we can do if we've got the marking of uh, electrical and mechanical equipment, the mechanical equipment, for example, is marked only with H. Uh, so if we've got a combined of both electrical and non-electrical equipment, it's just a combination. So for example, for uh, DBH means we've got a mechanical equipment plus a flame-proof electrical equipment, for example. And what you see here is now the relation, uh, general relation between EPLs, categories, and zones. So the um, uh, EPL and the grouping given in our standards, the equipment group and the equipment category given in the directive, and which is applicable in which zone, which is given also in one of our 10-1 um, or 10-2 standards. And you see the EPL is a link between the manufacturer and the user. The manufacturer says, well, my equipment is good for an EPL GB. And the user is saying, well, good, I'm looking for an equipment which fulfills the EPL GB, done. Okay, some words to the standardization. You know, I've uh, seen that we've got the, on the international level, the ITU ISO and IC, which is also for the European level, the ETSI, SAN and SANELEC. Uh, in Cyprus now, you've got this uh, CYS. In Germany, for example, we've got the DEAN, which is responsible for the mechanical part, so SAN and ISO and the DKE for the uh, electrical part for Senelec and IC. Now, looking specifically to the uh, standardization explosion protection, we've got electrical equipment. And for that electrical equipment, we publish a series 6079 series of standards. So 79 means explosion protection. 600 means it's a standard which is a parallel voting between IEC and Europe. So TC31 on the IC level is producing the 6079 series of standards for electrical equipment. But the explosion protection, the physics behind does not care if it's electrical or non-electrical. The physics behind is the same. That's the reason why under TC31, we've got a subcommittee, which is called 31M. And 31M produces for non-electrical equipment, the 8079 series of standards. And in this specific situation, 800 is for an IEC committee producing ISO standards. So we are one of the examples when IEC committee produces also ISO standards or ISO IEC standards. And then, of course, we've got the parallel voting procedures with SEN or SENELEC and the translation to national standards. We've got the committee, which is very old. Uh, the scope is the same as for the SENELEC 
scope. The reason is on the electrical side, we do not make any more standardization work on the Senelec level or the electrical activities are part of the IEC uh, 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 level. This is a little bit different to SEN. SEN is more active with more European standards, but on the uh, European level of SEN Elect TC31, we are doing the work on the IC level. You can find a lot of information about TC31. You just need to follow that web link, which is uh, www.iscch slash TC31. And then you can find all the informations related to TC31. All of our working groups and of our subcommittees, we've got three subcommittees, one subcommittee dealing for intrinsic safety, one for the users, the classification of hazardous areas and installation requirements, and as I mentioned, 31M for the non-electrical equipment. We've got working groups, which are dealing with one specific topic, and we've got maintenance teams, project teams, working on a specific standard. And we have for each standard, which is available on these seven, uh, 79 series a specific working group or maintenance team within TC31. We've got joint groups with other topics. And as I mentioned, with our other subcommittees, uh, 31G producing standards for the intrinsic safety and 31J producing the standards for the users. So the series of 10.1, 10.2 for the classification 13 for uh, the, the uh, pressurized housings, 14 for installation, 17, I think, re maintenance, and 19 for repair. And as I mentioned, we've got 31M producing the, the standards for the non-electrical equipment, which is done in working group one, with part 36 and 37. Um, We've got the maintenance teams for 20-1 and 20-2. This is the material characteristics uh, for gases and part two for dusts. So the MSG value, the minimum ignition uh, current, the, the, uh, and the, the related to the temperature class definitions, all are given uh, the minimum ignition temperature uh, are described in part 10-1. And we've got part 34 within the scope of 31M, which is for the application of the quality systems for electrical and non-electrical equipment. On the publication side, we've got the international standard, which is the document uh, established by consensus and approved by the IEC on a very high level. Uh, we've got the technical specification, which is done a little bit faster as a pre-document. Uh, uh, after three years, normally it's converted, uh, if needed, to a standard. Uh, we've got this time frame for, as described, uh, with this uh, proposal stage and the committee stage and inquiry and approval. Well, the wordings are a little bit different and the, the acronyms uh, to the European way, but uh, anyway, uh, we are following, following the same principles. And just to highlight the st status of our work, uh, uh, right now, nearly at the end is part two, which is the equipment protection by pressurized enclosures. Uh, definitely ready for publication is part 11, which is the equipment protection by intrinsic safety. And also at the end of uh, our work is the new uh, part 49, which is for flame arresters. This is an example where the European standard was transformed up to IEC and we start to make an IEC standard or because it's done by 31M, it's an ISO IEC standard. Uh, projects which are in review now, it's part zero, the general requirement, part one, flame proof, and seven for increased safety. We are working on a specific conditions of use as a general topic, and we are working on a so-called basic safety publication, a general document which could be used by all of our ISC and ISO committees. Now we've got 52 minutes. I was 
running through my slides. Um, I cannot go into detail of each one in one hour. This is what I meant, uh, the content of this webinar. It's a little bit of basics, a little bit of the European directive, a little bit of standards and standardization. And um, to have a more detailed view to all the specific topics, well, we can have a full day of training um, and we can identify those aspects with more details which are, are needed uh, for you all. And now I'm happy to, to listen to your questions and uh, to, for sure trying to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Siddens, thank you very much for your contribution and uh, you have a great expertise regarding the matter. Um, I know from my, from my experience that it's a very difficult market, the ATEX market and the, uh, the surveillance as well of the ATEX environment. And do we have any questions for Dr. Tiddens? If you have any questions, you are free to ask them. Uh, either by raising your hand or writing the question in the chat room if, you're not, uh, if you don't want to speak. I think we do not have a, uh, either they understand everything very well or they. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the problem I think is it's a very big topic and uh, it, it's just an overview of all. Um, for sure, uh, we have discussed whether to have a, an, an, a follow up full day training. <laughs> Uh, 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 what we can do, um, that's for sure. I'm happy to come to Cyprus. Um, what I can offer, of course, if there's any questions, uh, we, all of the participants just can send me an email and I try to answer. I cannot comp comprehensively answer everything maybe in the full detail, but I try to answer. That's a for sure offer. You can write me an email. There is a question. Uh... Good. Um, Mr. Agim, do you want to say that loud? Uh, I don't know if I'm on mute now. Yes, you're on mute. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, my question is about the um, technical specification uh, 60079 part 33 which is for special protection as I know that there are different views on this uh, special protection in Europe. And I would like to hear from Dr. Uh, Tedens his uh, position. Um, working in the field of standards, um, I've learned also in my, my professional history to to, uh, to to use the correct wording is very important. Um, and this is also uh, done with this specific part 33, uh, which is special protection. We've done this standard in the past in Europe. We know this special protection as marking and so on. Um, we have in Europe, as I explained, the ATEX directive. Um, normally, to fulfill the ATEX directive, we, we are using our harmonized standards, our normal part zero plus an additional type of protection, uh, uh, and, and we are done fine. Um, as I mentioned, we can have an equipment and we can identify specific techniques to say, well, this is a safe equipment. We don't use standards. We are using a technique which is developed by the manufacturer of that product in combination with tested of one of the notified bodies and saying, well, yes, it's a safe product and we can declare it based on the directive. It's a safe product. It fulfills the requirement of the directive. Um, that's good. That's the benefit of ATEX. Now looking to ICX. Um, ICX says, well, we need a compliance with standards. So ICX was asking TC31, can you produce a standard taking on board this principle of the ATEX directive? So um, 
I was also a member of uh, the project team for that special protection standard, and still I'm the convener of the, for the maintenance of part 33. Um, so part 33 describes the system, uh, uh, how to identify, we call them independent verifiers, uh, 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 to say, well, a manufacturer is doing a technique, involve, uh, then starts to involve one of the independent verifiers to come to the conclusion that the product is safe. It's just the uh, uh, tr uh, transport this idea of the ATEX directive to ICX. Now ICX is possible to issue a certificate of conformity based on part 33. The difference between um, ATEX and ICX is, so the technical part is the same. Right? We've got a product, uh, we've got specific uh, uh, techniques to make uh, out of that a safe product, and that's done. The difference is the, the way behind. In Europe, we can do it with one notified body for all EPLs. On the ICX system, uh, um, we create this independent verifier level uh, for EPL C, for other, so zone two, only one independent verifier is needed. For uh, EPL uh, GB or DB, for example, two. And if you want to have a special protection product for uh, zone zero, you need three independent verifiers. And the independent verifiers should come from different organizations. So it's just 33, it's just for the ATEX to fulfill the ATEX directive on the IC level. So it's That's not that. affected in any way that it's still a technical specification and not published as a full EM standard? Uh, it's a standard. Part 33 is a standard, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, so not yet. I see. 33. It is. Uh, let me have a look. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, Uh, where I am, I can share my screen. You see, this is the actual version of part 33. Yes, I it's, see some, uh, it, agree with that. It's an IEC uh, standard, yeah. Yes, but not published yet as a full EN standard. No, th that's clear because we don't need that standard in Europe. Why, why should I involve two notified bodies when I can do it by myself, just using one. Okay. So uh, this is one example uh, where we say we don't need this standard in Europe. Because if I want to use part 33, I can do it with the directive itself. This is the reason why we don't, I've, I'm not sure which the level of the EN is, but I don't think that we have that on the EN level. I'm yeah, not sure about that. It's a TS. Ah, it's a TS, TS yeah, just a specification, yeah. So more or less, well, there's a standard, You, it could be used, but no, no one will use it in Europe, uh, as it's for, for sure, uh, I can do it by myself. Okay. Uh, that, one more question, if I may ask, it's about yeah, sure. um, uh, zone two. I know that uh, a manufacturer can make a self-declaration, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes the market requires, let's say, um, a notified body to be involved. And my question is, can a notified body issue an EU type examination certificate for zone two for a specific uh, product? Clear question, clear answer, no. No. So, um, a notified body with a certificate saying, I'm a notified body, my number is, for example, 0102 SPTB, we issue a certificate for a category three equipment. That's not allowed. Because as a notified body, 0102, I cannot do that. The directive says when I can issue a certificate. So I cannot do it as notified body. 
I cannot issue a, now the wording, EU type exclamation certificate, because this is not specifically only required for category one or category two electrical equipment. I cannot issue an EU type examination certificate, but I can issue a, a type examination certificate. This is done by some other bodies. And as I said, oh, for sure, uh, notified bodies issuing a piece of paper with a different title saying this is a category three equipment according to the ATEX directive. But they are doing this not as a notified body and not with an EU type examination certificate. It could be done by my grandmother. Uh, it, it, it could be done by anybody, by any company. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the, the key point. Um, for sure it's done. It's a voluntary base done to issue such certificate. And now we come to the combination of uh, um, ICX. If um, uh, more or less it's in some cases, a manufacturer is not sure, well, um, EX is not my main business and I'm not sure, I'm not really confident of what I'm doing also for category three equipment. I need a third party to have a look on. Yes, this could be done. Um, even if a user requires, well, I'm not so confident with my uh, manufacturers. Uh, I want to have a certificate of a third party. You may use an ICX certificate, even for Europe. Yeah, to say for a manufacturer, look, I've got for my category three equipment an, an ICX certificate. For sure, that's not the standalone document. It's just an additional document because the manufacturer for sure has to provide the CE uh, EU declaration of conformity and the manual. This is requirement, required by the directive also for category three equipment. But behind of this official document could be, for example, an ICX certificate for category three not for category one or two, yeah? You have to separate it. It's just, as I mentioned, the, the certificate for category three is voluntary. If it's voluntary, it's not described by the directive. I can use each piece of paper where it said certificate. And for sure, I can trust a certificate issued by uh, a, a body, which is also a notified body. Uh, and I can trust on the certificate issued by an IICX certification body for, for category three. Okay. Thank you so much for your answers. My pleasure. And, 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 and these questions are shown that it's very tricky because you, we are dealing now with legal aspects on one hand, standardization aspects, uh, different uh, uh, conformity assessment schemes and, and market access and the, the, the world is not black and white. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions for uh, our expert? Of course, you are. Uh, uh, you can send us the questions, and we can direct them to Dr. Stevens if you need any clarification regarding what he said, or if you need any advice. So I would like uh, very much to thank Dr. Stevens for his contribution and his expertise. It was our honor and privilege to have you here. You are an, an expert in the field. <laughs> I, I think everybody understands that. And you are leading the, the activities in IC level as well. Uh, I would like also to thank all of you for your attendance. Um, although the, the ATEX environment is very demanding in terms of knowledge, I think we, were, uh, we are able to have a clearer view of what exists in terms of standards and schemes. Uh, a brief questionnaire will be sent to you for your feedback. Please share with us your, uh, your opinions, what subjects you need to be needs to be covered in the ADEX environment. So because we are planning uh, further activities in the, in the ADEX environment and uh, having a training seminar, your feedback regarding what you need to learn it will be very valuable in preparing for the training seminars. 
It just uh, will take a couple of minutes. Thank you all for your presence and have a nice day. Special thanks to Dr. Stevens. <laughs> Bye -bye. I have to say thank you. My pleasure to be with you here. <laughs> thanks for organizing. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.